Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm excited to have you all join us today for what feels like an inescapably trending topic, generative AI. I would love to introduce our panelists for the day. So first, uh, Manish Sanwal. He is head of AI engineering at News Corp, where he spearheads the development and implementation of cutting edge AI technologies. With a strong background in mobile architecture, Manish has held various engineering leadership positions at City, Toys R Us, and Chase. He's currently pursuing his master's degree focused on artificial intelligence at the University of Texas, Austin, with an emphasis in reinforcement learning. Very timely, Manish. Uh, and Kaylee Boggs. Uh, Kaylee is the head of the Andela Data Practice with 10 years of data science and AI experience. Prior to Andela, Kaylee earned her PhD in sociology at the Florida State University, which led to her work as a data science doing statistical modeling, automation, analytics for both private and public education companies in higher education. Uh, and at Andela, she's guiding our customers on the best use cases, model options, and techniques to leverage generative AI. And finally, myself, I'm Kelly Wenzel. I am a six-time CMO, 30 years of technology marketing experience, though relatively new to Andela. Uh, I spent the last five years at Amazon, most recently where I was leading global business-to-business -business marketing and developer engagement at Alexa. So guys, thank you very much for, for joining. Ex excited to have you. Before I jump into the conversation, I am going to give 60 seconds, literally, of background on Andela for those of you who aren't familiar with us. So Andela was founded on the premise that brilliance is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. And so the company has assembled a talent network, a diverse global talent marketplace, which is approaching 200,000 skilled engineers around the world, helping enterprises tap into new talent pools with emphasis in areas like Africa and Latin America. It is powered by the Andela Talent Cloud. So this is a unified platform that automates the entire hiring life cycle. So making it easy to uh, source, qualify and assess, um, hire, manage and pay engineering talent borderless anywhere in the world. And finally, we're known for our flexible uh, delivery models. So for example, if you wanna hire an engineer or you wanna hire a full team, which in the case of News Corp as you'll hear is what they chose to do, um, or you can engage us in a fully managed service. We have served more than 600 clients with a 96% talent match success rate. Uh, so now with that out of the way, I'm gonna give just a quick bit of context for News Corp and the project that we're about to discuss. So as you may know, News Corp is one of the world's most largest and trusted media companies. Uh, their portfolio includes business and news publications like um, HarperCollins, Barron's, The Sunday Times, The Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, Realtor.com, and many more. And so recognizing that they wanted to innovate their customer experience, they thought, News Corp, that uh, generative AI might be a way for them to jumpstart that innovation. So the company was holding its first ever global hackathon with engineering talent from all of its portfolio brands from all over the world, and they turned to Andela for help. And with that, I will turn it over to Kaylee. Thanks again, Kelly. Uh, very excited to be here talking about our innovative work in the Gen AI space. Um, and what we're hearing from a lot of our enterprise clients is really that they're in the exploratory stage of adopting these generative AI tools. They've heard all the hype. They're very excited. They want to move very quickly. But many times they first lack the understanding of the industry. These models are really advancing quickly. There are new tools and capabilities coming out every day. In addition, they lack the bandwidth uh, and the skill set to get those off the ground. So Indela, uh, in answer to that, has created really a standardized POC that's six weeks to get these products off the ground. And so what we do here is give companies a real world use case to understand the return on investment and be able to quickly assess if this is a project that is going to save them time and increase productivity without the large investment in a long-term project or uh, the computing power that it can take uh, at the next scaling these projects. So these have a quick turnaround time. We can use sample data to cut out all of the access and security issues and be able to really show what these products can do in a quick amount of time. For News Corp, we came in, they were preparing, as you said, for their first global hackathon focused on AI. And Andela was able to come in and bring in our team of five engineers, back end to front end, 
large language model expertise, machine learning, and set up a six-week POC exploring those large language models. Um, this not only was able to get a lot of findings and understanding both the cost, what's needed to set out set up in-house LLMs, uh, but also for their hackathon was able to give them that back-end infrastructure to accelerate the hackathon for those projects and the participants and also create a better user experience. At the end product, we did have our user-friendly chat bot and that was able to be shown uh, and demoed to the business stakeholders so that they could really understand what the product was, be able to test, um, and it had a wide variety of models and parameters that they were able to play with. So uh, since we have such a great group of enterprise stakeholders here on the call, I am going to open up a poll question. Um, and we'd really like to know where you're at in your generative AI projects uh, and putting those into deployment. So we'll give everybody a second to fill this out and we will check in on the results. This will be interesting just to see how far people are progressing. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a selfish question for me to know. I'll be fully honest. I'm very curious about this. And this is the perfect audience to ask since they're clearly interested in AI. Okay, yeah. Uh, 61% not started yet, but also here interested, um, and 4% projects completed and in progress. Uh, and Manish, I'm going to turn it over to you now to ask the technical details and uh, also get your take on our results there. Thank you, Kelly. If you can go, yes. Um, hello everyone. Um, um, I'm Manish Sanwal. Um, so large language model really came into scene when OpenAI came up with GPT-3 and GPT-3.5 engines. But fast forward today, uh, there are many different offerings to choose from. Um, the one you could go with OpenAI's uh, proprietary model, like Anthropic, OpenAI Cohere. You could go with subscription-based model, Google Palm, Amazon Bedrock is coming out. Or you could you could go a third, go towards a third, third alternative, which is to, to, you, to have or host an in-house LLM. And that is what we tried to do uh, in this in this experiment that we ran. So uh, we wanted to understand first of all how these in-house LLM works under the hood. What is their ecosystem like? Um, comparing their cost. Uh, what different types of LLMs are there? What different tech they use internally? Um, resources required, infrastructure or human resources, or what different type of training is required. So. That's the whole motivation behind uh, the experimentation that we ran. If you go to Hugging Face today, there are many different models to choose from. There are there are models from companies like Meta. Llama has come out a couple of days back or a week back now. Um, and then there are models from uh, Hugging Face itself, Bloom. Uh, there are Falcon, Raven, like there are many different models. And so how do you choose? Manish, I'll just ask you one quick question too to explain to our stakeholders maybe that are at a higher level uh, what Hugging Face is and how you can use it. Good question. Many times we engineer, we just take it for granted. So Hugging Face <laughs> is, think about Hugging Face as GitHub for AI. So um, it, is, it, is a, it is a platform where AI engineers or AI enthusiasts, they, they, they share the models that, that, that they create. They, uh, they keep those like they they maintain these models and all. So this is a sharing platform for AI models, and it's 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 a little more than that. If you see it from the uh, from the business point of view, it 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 provides you a model card where you can have the the papers linked to that model or the parameters or what the tech behind these models are. So it is it is a whole ecosystem for uh, for sharing and uh, using AI models. So that's hugging face. Um, so I was at yes. Uh, so you have these different varieties of uh, of open source model, but how do you choose a model for your use case? So I I think, and this is what I came up with is like those four these four parameters, which you could four very broad parameters, which you could use to um, probably figure out which which model would probably be best for you. So the first one is. Is, is the use case. So you should really hone in the hone in the use case what you have. Uh, you should you should think about what type of accuracy do you need, what type of data you need, how much data do you have, uh, who is the audience? Is it internal or external? That would probably decide 
um, the accuracy that you need on the data or, or on the on the outputs. So use case is the first one. Second is infrastructure. So uh, you should really think about um, what type of infrastructure is available to you. Do you have um, A100 type of GPUs available or not? Um, also, sometimes uh, you would see the numbers associated with these uh, these models, like this is a 7 billion model or this is a 60 billion model. So usually that indicates, so that 60 billion parameters is actually the uh, directly proportional to the memory it would need on the GPU to do one inference. Now, that ties into the cost that you would be you would be seeing at the end of the month on your infrastructure bill. So that also probably uh, push you to choose the correct model for your use case. So that's the uh, that's the other thing that you should be looking at. Licensing, uh, again, based off of the use case, sometimes you may just want to experiment. In other cases, you might you may want to go commercial. So look at the licenses. There are some open source model which are which are available for commercial use, including Llama. So you could you should look at the licensing, what what that indicates. And finally, and that may be the most important for the technical folks out there, uh, what is the internal architecture of this model? How well does it train? How well, do, how well does it scale? What does the maintenance looks like? Uh, and what is the tech behind it uh, in, a, in a nutshell? So, and the good news, as I said earlier, uh, all of this information is available on Hugging Face. So if you open the model card, there are, there are a lot of resources available, including what data in most of the cases, not all, but in what data it is trained on. Um, and in some cases that data is also publicly available. So you could see for yourself uh, how, well this, how well this model would react to certain situations. Um, if this model is instruct-based model, so if you are using a chatbot, if your use case is somewhat related to chatbot, you would probably wanna, uh, you would probably want an instruct-based model. If your use case is more chat completion, you would want a, a text-based model. So there are like all of that information is there uh, is mostly available on Hugging Space, and uh, so I would say take these four things into consideration um, and choose a model which which is correct for your infrastructure, your use case, and probably like the 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 type of training that you want to do, which sort of uh, ties, uh, which sort of takes us to the next step of choosing the model is. Training the model. If you go to next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So, training the model is again. Um, if you if you host a model on your infrastructure and you make the requests and it gives you some vanilla responses, that's that's cool for experimentation. But if you want to create a very good user centric or very good user experience, you would want this uh, this model to. Um, to create, to do inferences based off of the data that you have. Um, and that's where the whole power comes in. Now, there are two ways you can actually do that. You can either fine tune a model uh, or you can do embedding. So fine tuning, uh, it seems a very fancy word, but this is this is not new. This has been, uh, this has been out there in AI ML world for a while. It's called transfer learning, where you take and take an off the shelf, very, very well generalized model and then you train it on, on your small data set. So what, what it does is it actively changes the way the, the model is created. It actively changes the, the weights of the neurons inside the model. And, uh, and, uh, and as you can just imagine by that, it seems like a lot more work. It seems like ML expertise is needed. And yes, it, you would need some ML expertise for that. Uh, you would need, uh, and the first time you would run the training, it would not be successful. You would have to run it multiple times. But once you have a very finely, very fine-tuned model, it would give you the best inferences possible. Because you could think like this, this model only knows about your data. It does not know anything else. So it would not hallucinate at that point. Um, so that's, that's where fine-tuning comes in. Whereas embedding is, a contrary to this, like very, very opposite. In this case, in case of embedding, you do not actually touch the model. Of course, the model is running in 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 one, let's say, EC2 instance. But uh, what you would do is you would take your data, you would convert this data into vector representation, uh, which which is called embedding, 
and then you save it in a vector store. And then instead of directly querying the model, you would query this intermediate layer, which receives your query, goes to this vector store, do some sort of similarity search, and returns you the output, which is actually the context for the query. So at that point, this is the context built off of your data, and it takes it to the LLM to form the response. Now, many times this context is limited by the token that you can send to uh, send to the model. So there are chances where it could go in a different place. Now, uh, but what I have seen is embedding in itself is really, really powerful. Many of the uh, use cases that you are seeing that you would see built off of the open open AI's API, sorry, uh, are mostly the embedding based learning. So both of them have their own potential. Both of them are good based off of the use cases. And I would say, uh, if you are starting your journey with the with the experiments, you would probably start with embedding because this is a lighter lift. You are not touching the model. You do not need that much ML expertise. Um, the only uh, ML expertise that you need is to create embedding or the selecting the vector store and all that. But from then on, it's uh, it's probably a more engineering effort rather than an AI ML effort. Um, so that's those are two different types of learning. Now I. I want to point out one more thing here, and that is the, the data sets and the use cases. Now, uh, what type of use cases you can use with, with, with these models? That's, that's a fair question. Um, so what we end up doing is we wanted to try out, like we wanted to see uh, most of the landscape of what, what different experiments could, can happen. So we, we, used one, um, uh, we used one structured data set and we used one unstructured data set. So un un unstructured data sets are your documents, your, your PDFs. So what you can do is you can extract data out of it. You can extract numbers, tables, and that becomes one of the data source. Uh, the other input could be the, the data that's sitting in your database. Usually it does not work well with numbers because these are natural language, natural language models. So, but if you have a lot of text sitting in your in your data data sets, you could use them to create a pipeline and train these models using embedding on fine tuning based off of your use case. But um, but it the the use case could be very very broad uh, in that sense. Okay, so just to sum up too, it sounds like for our 61% uh, of our audience who hasn't started these projects, um, some kind of takeaway suggestions are embeddings can be a much easier lift uh, and a kind of a quick win, um, as well as starting with smaller parameter models. I know we hear a lot of talk about how many billions and trillions of parameters um, they're trained on as an impressive stat, uh, but using some of those smaller models can be almost just as effective as the really large language models that are more expensive and use more compute power. Are, am I, keep me honest, is that, a, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up. And uh, just about while we are talking about embedding. So uh, just, a, just a quick on what embedding is and, or what data, what vector data storage are. So embedding is uh, a vector representation of your data. So usually what you do is you take uh, these uh, off the shelf machine learning models, which are which can take your data and generate embeddings for you. And then what you do is take this embedding and store it in the in the in the in those vector databases. So there are there are many different vector databases out there. Starting from there is a there is one easy one open source uh, available on AWS, which is Chroma. It's a file based uh, one. There are there is one API based which is Pinecone, where in that case the vector embedding sits in their infrastructure. But Pinecone is really good in like you know if you uh, if you don't care where your data is sitting, um, so Pinecone could be a very good alternative. There are other which which are like Postgres based or SQL based uh, vector databases available. So there is a lot to choose from in here. Uh, but the but the idea is if you if you are if you understand your use case you could really think about which, what, what works best for you in terms of learning and what works best for you in terms of, uh, in terms of the, uh, the actual vector storage. 
Okay, and okay. Uh, just for our, our audience too, um, let's talk just a little bit about kind of the logic behind using embeddings or the models that are in fine tuning and embeddings to help determine that the the most appropriate model for your use case. So, you know, embeddings taking this the data versus fine tuning, that's an instruct answer kind of a, a model. Could you talk a little bit about how that logic plays out in both of those use cases? Um yeah, so embedding usually is uh, it's it's not only only about ch chat. So um, I would I would put it the put it the different way. So I would say it's the ability of model what it can do for you. So if the model is an instruct based model, so uh, for those of you who have not who have heard, who have not heard this instruct based model, uh, so when when the when these models are trained, they are trained on like on a, a, a huge corpus of data. But then they they are then you, what you could do is you could take an instruction set which is the question and answer and then you can train these models again. So under the hood, these models just any AI model for that sense they just see the patterns in something, right? So if it's image based, it would see the pattern in images. In this case, it would see the pattern on this lang natural language. So if you if you have never fed it a question it would not know what a question is and how to answer a question. And that's where instruct model comes in. So you train these models on an instruction set, which is like a question and answer. So it understands what is a question uh, and how to form a response for a question. So, and that's where these chat enabled model comes in or instruct based model comes in. So which understands your question and which can answer your question. And from then on, you create embedding on it or you fine tune it. Both of them would work as long as um, if you are fine tuning, you need to make sure if you are if you are feeding it for it for an instruct based model, the fine tuning data set should be in the instruct format so that it remembers that what a question is and how to answer a question. So that's that's basically it. Got it. So fine tuning is training on the uh, the question and answer kind of text, and then embeddings is really looking for that predictive how the text is answering or how the text is structured to kind of predict what the next word or next sentence is. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to our audience again, one more time and ask a polling question. Um, so I know a lot of people haven't launched into using either of these models, but if you have, which did you have the most success with embedding or fine tuning? And then after we see these results, I think we're going to, open it up to the audience for questions. I guess while while we are getting the answer, I just want to clear this up that uh, the embedding actually sits outside. You just create context based off the embedding. Now this model could be a text generation model, could be code generation model for that for, for that purpose, codex models, could be um, Oh, many of them haven't used. So uh, yeah, could be could this model could do any number of things for you, but the embedding sits outside and just provides the context to your query. Okay. Oh yeah. So interesting. Um, I think most haven't used, but uh, having more success with embeddings. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to the audience. But I, before I take their questions, have one for you as well. Uh, we've heard a lot of concerns uh, from many stakeholders regarding the security around generative AI and setting up large language models. Can you talk about how you've addressed those concerns or how, how you view the security risk? Um, yeah, so security, um, I, I, would, I would put it in two different buckets. So first of all is the security of the infrastructure itself. So this model is running on your infrastructure. So if your infrastructure is secured, your model is secure. So it's as good as your infrastructure. So in that case, there is nothing different. Now, there is the other part of it, which is the adversarial attack on these models. So these models are susceptible for attacks like any other any other model. Like now back in the day, we used to have SQL injection. So similar sort of thing can be done in here. You can have negative, negative prompts and it could it would generate something it should not generate so what what you should have is is the engineering layer on top of it where where you would have a layer which filters the responses uh, which which checks for uh, like you know hate speech or whatnot so it's 
it's it's the uh, and that's the layer where you would write your business rules right? so no pii if, if you are if you are like in a banking customer like you know, no pii has been has been sent or or things of that nature so there you would have to write this this layer on top of it um and in in cases if you are using the proprietary models some of those models actually give you some of these layers like you know i have seen recently on open ai there is they i think they provide you audit trails so you know what request came in and what what response was given um there is uh, i i think they also provide you the content monitoring uh, or i think um uh, they, they can monitor uh, some of the content and provide like you know, whether it's hate speech or whatnot so it it, it there are ways uh, you could do that um, and it's it's mostly on the engineering off engineering side to to come up with the solutions on it. Okay, and we'll see if we have more questions about that. I know we're at one minute. Uh, can you, yeah, super quickly wrap up our our main key learnings uh, from this project? Sure. Um, okay, super quick. <laughs> um, yes, first of all, and it's it's not ground shattering, but it's really important that in-house LLMs are are an alternate. So uh, you don't really need to look look at Google's or OpenAI's. There are there is a third alternate available. Be, again, based off of your use case, I I would I would say really really work on the use case why why you are using it, where you are using it, and if there is if there is a if you see fit, open uh, open source LLM could fill in that gap for you. Now again, going back to use case, if you have now, if you have chosen the LLM, cho chosen the LLM that you are going in with, training the LLM both embedding and fine tuning could would work. Embedding itself, even though it seems inferior of both, inferior of two, but embedding is a very easy lift, and it could really provide uh, quick value, or at least it it can prove out your your concept. So that's um, embedding itself is like really really good powerful training methodology. So use embedding or fine tuning based off of the use case. Um, third is context. Now, uh, and this is where uh, this is where I see most of the people um, when they talk about LLM, they immediately think about the open AI's chat interface. Um, so in that interface, you see uh, whenever you type a question, it automatically know what your context is, which previous question you are referring to. And um, if you ask a follow-up question, it it figures out how to form a response based off of the earlier conversation. So that, but under the hood, these models are just a stateless machines. They do not know which answer was given in the past. So context was made. Context needs to be built on top of these LLMs. That's more of the engineering job. Now, uh, context is also dependent on the type of uh, type of use case you have. If you have a chatbot sort of use case. Yes, uh, LLM, um, OpenAI's um, use case, but but it's it's similar to OpenAI's use case, and the model that they have for context would work. But if you have some other use case, the context might look different to you. So need to really really make sure your context is and context is correct in order to provide the great user experiences. Data quality, um, again, all the AI, all the data engineers could tell you. The, the the better the data is, the better the outcomes would be. But it's a little more than that. And you have you can have a very great pipeline built in, but the data could have inherent biases. And based off your business use case, based off um, uh, based off the your data sets, you must or in order for getting a good good inference, you should remove these biases or at least mitigate those. There is another thing which is sample variance. And again, any any data guy would tell you like this sample never represents the whole population. So the variances are different. And that could really play with uh, that could really play with the model. You cannot train model with the infinite data available. So data quality, biases, and sample variances really work on those. The 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 quality of data would dictate the quality of quality of the inferences that you get. And last but not the least, infrastructure. Uh, think about what type of infrastructure is available to you, what cost you can incur, and uh, that would allow you to many a time. It is it is the good indication to choose where to start, which model to start with, how to prove your concept. 
Um, and from then on, you can build build upon the learnings that you have, build upon the learnings of tech learning of model and learning of the use case that you have. Um, so yeah, Kelly, that was a quick wrap up for the slide. Thank you. And, and I would just so add just in wanna... one more too, uh, which is along the way, testing was key to every lesson we learned. Testing, testing, testing along the way, each and every time. That's especially as we're uh, charting or, you know, going into uncharted waters, uh, being able to test and actually get the real results so that you have that, uh, not the theoretical knowledge, uh, was really key to figuring out a lot of the ins and outs of really getting a successful project. Thanks, Kaylee. So I'm just going to call out to the participants. Most of you are actually still with us hanging in, uh, even though we're running a little bit long. I mean, I just want to call out those of the, you that do need to drop. Please, if you wouldn't mind taking our survey, it should take you less than two minutes. It's in the resources tab in the bottom right. That'll help shape our future uh, content programming. Uh, and now we'll shift over to audience q and I do have uh, a couple that have rolled in here for you, Manish. So the first one that we'll um, answer is, from what I've read on the internet, cust uh, training custom data is expensive. Did you find that to be the case with News Corp data? Uh, I can broadly tell you it is not. What, what they tell you is, uh, if you want to train your model on the, huge, the whole internet, it takes 220 millions. Probably yes, probably right. But you are not training the model on that amount of data. You would be, you would have like a few gigs of data, maybe 100 gigs of data. But it's not, it's not that costly. It's not that costly. Okay. Then the next one is, um, can you clarify just what was the reason for opting for open source rather than using open using Open AI's Chat GPT? Um, yeah. So uh, as you can think. There are there are cost implications. There are implications on uh, Chat GPT does not uh, does not say which data it is trained on, and so on and so forth. Like many many different things. But if you if you could just compare the cost, like just take one measure of cost, and um, and just take take the number from their website and multiply it with uh, with the number of requests that you can that you can think of in the production, probably you would get the answer. So why you need to experiment? Um, so I think that's basically the answer. Like, you know, there are always good alternates out there, and we wanted to seek, we wanted to figure out those alternates, and if those alternates are, uh, those alternate works for us. All right, I'm tra trailing through these. I'll ask you one because uh, it'll give me selfishly time to read some more <laughs> questions. Um, I'm curious, Manish, uh, especially because there are so many folks with us who haven't even tried yet um, or started experimenting. What was the biggest surprise that you ran into during this uh, proof of concept and your, your hackathon like getting started? Oh, there, there were many. Um, uh, one off the top of my mind um, I could think of is training is, Training is a trickier part. Like, and, and the more you think you know it, uh, the more you actually don't know it. So uh, I would tell you like one of the models that we were using and uh, we started training it. it. We thought the training is going pretty well, but when we started inferring it, um, it sort of lost its ability to, uh, to understand what a question is. So yeah, so there is always this learning and then then it then it uh, forced us to go back, read about how that model is working, how what what sort of tech is under the hood. And that that made us think, OK, this is not the right model for our use case. We should be using some other types of model. So, yeah, uh, there is a lot of learning. There is a lot of surprises. But I think those are good surprises. Those those sort of pushes you to learn more, understand more. Uh, and that would probably help us uh, shaping the next project, shaping or understanding better about the next use case that we look at. Yeah, Kaylee, I guess this would be best for you, which is you talked about, uh, we mentioned this innovation uh, hub, the pod or team that we assembled. Can you say more about what the specific roles were um, and how long did it take you or I guess Andela <laughs> to, to assemble that? Yeah, uh, sure. So in, in this instance, um, we brought in a team of uh, five engineers, and then we also have our internal consultants. Um, so we did need back end to front end, as well as the large language model and 
uh, machine learning expertise. So backend is really key. Um, you've got to have all the APIs for deployment. We also had to have a data engineer for the CI CD pipeline to make sure that was deployed smoothly. Um, then the large to go dig into the research and fully understand that under the hood, which everybody on our team is excited to learn, which is great. Uh, but we also did need someone that has that expertise in machine learning uh, to kick them off and to be able to really understand that research and the next steps. And then on the front end, uh, front, a good front end designer uh, for the user friendly experience and to really understand how we can get all of the models and all of the options in just to one UI that's user friendly. Um, and I think one suggestion there I would give is, on that roadmap, fully understanding, you know, with your use case, what you want your UI to be so that you can get that done early. Um, and project wise to having both the team that does want to learn. And when you're identifying that use case, identifying something that is a narrow focus, and you can verify the answers and has an actual measurable metric of success in order which to test to make sure that your, your uh, chatbot or gen AI tool is successful. Got it. Okay. And I have, I'm going to kind of merge together what is like a combination of a couple different questions, but they're all in the same theme, um, which is what guardrails are you putting in place, um, especially considering the AI will uh, inherently carry bias? So, uh, you know, and obviously we read about this in the, in the news a lot, like that there can be bias in the model. So how are you guarding against this? Um, so I cannot go into the specifics, but in, in general, um, it's it's not a new problem. It is like uh, you talk to any data engineer, like any statistical, uh, if anybody reads statistics, there is always this, this problem of sample not representing the actual population. Um, and that's one type of bias you would see everywhere. And there are there are ways in uh, if you if you think about training and all, there are ways to get around it. Uh, some of the biases um, are in data itself. So those biases needs to be removed. So yeah, uh, there are there are um, there are experiments going on, not only not only here, but everywhere throughout the industry. And this is this is something which is which is a uh, which is a very burning topic and very rightly so. And uh, and I, I I hope to see a lot of development in this area in um, in future on the AI on the AI front. Thank you so much. So in the interest of time, I'm actually going to pause uh, and wrap us up here. I will just say for the unanswered questions that we did not get to, uh, Kelly has committed to address those offline. So we will follow up and make sure that your questions got answered. So look for some follow up content there. Um, Obviously, I first want to say, like, thank you, Manish and Kaylee, for a really interesting conversation. Uh, and thank you for everyone else for carving out time in your day to join us. Uh, quick reminder to look at the resource tab. Um, there's a helpful one pager uh, QR code that would lead you to more AI impact assessment that Kaylee talked about earlier and also our two minute survey. And with that, I will wrap us up and say thanks very much, Kaylee and Manish. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.